not as emotional as it might have been, uh, uh, as the impression might have been given right now. Uh, I think you are able to see my screen. Can I have a short nod or any kind of? Yes, it's thank fine. you very much. Perfect. Um, yes, thank you very much. Uh, have a lovely morning to everyone. I'm very glad to be able to speak to you today. Uh, the topic of my talk, the title of my talk is and for my next trick, I'll make your wallet disappear, which of course refers to um, your predatory business models in uh, free to play, mostly free to play games, and how they affect uh, adolescents. Um, normally, traditionally, magicians do not reveal the tricks, of course, uh, that is exactly what I'll be trying to do right now with you. Um, in Yes, in order to, to show the, the relations with these mechanics to, uh, to adolescents, meaning, firstly, I'd like to have a short look with you together in uh, into the mechanics that uh, come to play when it comes to to free to play games. Of course, this will only be a small proportions of, of the mechanics due to time issues that we have today. And uh, secondly, I'd like to uh, show you a small part of the findings of my PhD thesis, where we can uh, yes see these um, mechanics in play so to say, and uh, see the direct affections that they have on, in this case, adolescent people. Well, um, of course, you know that uh, the, I hope so at least, that the, the game model of games as a service of, uh, of free to play games prevailed during the last few years, meaning that the uh, free to play games are the kind of games that are more popular among especially young people and young gamers that like to uh, firstly go, quickly go over three of the games that um, were mentioned and played the most by my, by our, or my, my participants of, of my uh, study. This is of course uh, Fortnite, the well-known um, comic-like um, um, shooter game that uh, um, yes, you, may, you might have played or not played. If you didn't, you should. It's uh, really well done for a triple play game. Uh, this is a victory royale that you see there. Uh, it's the uh, goal of the game, meaning if you are, are able to uh, win against every other player, you will be uh, you get a victory royale, and this is equal to status gain, to pure status gain. If you are in uh, elementary school and your peer group, if you're male and your peer group plays, uh, plays um, Fortnite, this uh, having a victory royale is pure status game. It's a very important thing and it adds to your coolness in class, of course. Um, another game that's very popular among especially younger people is the aforementioned Brawl Stars um, that Christine's participant, participant in Christine's study also played. Uh, also very comically, from a static uh, point of view, you see that the main target group might be young, might be children, might be adolescents. Uh, yes, um, Brawl Stars known for, um, for making money, for creating revenue through, this, uh, through selling of loot boxes, loot boxes that are um, yes, the part of the free to play uh, gaming mechanics that are most well known and they are most well researched as well by now, but they are only represent only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to these mechanics. Um, quite a little bit, bit more blatantly, of course, but also very, very uh, popular among young people. Coin Master, I don't think anyone didn't hear of this game by now because it was very popular also in uh, German media. Um, Grandmaster is, of course, a simulated gambling app that not only creates revenue from data, you see that I'm logged in with my Facebook account here, but also by, yes, uh, giving people the opportunity to use this slot machine here in order to spend money. Uh, Coinmaster, uh, by the way, is the highest grossing app in the, um, in the Google Play Store for about, since about two years now, uh, subsequently, with big uh, the, <laughs> with a big difference to the others, you can take a look at it, it's quite startling. <clears throat> well, it's not only Coinmaster, of course, that creates lots of revenue. Every free-to-play game does. Um, 
never mind this uh, prediction for the 2022 20, global market. Uh, I just wanted to show you this number. Uh, the mobile game revenues in 2020 were predicted to account for almost 50% of the global market, meaning that uh, free-to-play mechanics account for about 50% of the revenue the whole market makes. Um, this does not include games such as FIFA, who also add up to this number. So it might be uh, significantly more than 50% uh, of the revenue that's created by games that are free to play. And um, so the question, of course, arises, uh, if these case, games are free, how, why would anyone pay for them? And uh, I will go into this with you by starting with the Ludic contract that many of you might know. Uh, this is, there's there lots of different definitions for this. Uh, this is the one by Jesse Shell that I go with, meaning that if you as the player um, take time, invest time, invest energy, invest even money into a game, um, and accept to suffer through the frustration as well, the game developer, on the other hand, agrees to give you the most pleasurable experience that is possible. Um, meaning there's a contract that builds on trust on trust between the player and the game developer. And the question is, what if one of those two, the player or the developer, breaks the contract? And in this case, for example, designs a game that is not, uh, that does not, has not the target, the aim of creating a most fun and pleasurable experience, but maybe um, altering, altering behavior of the player even outside the game. And here it comes to a, we come to a, a term that's called the dark patterns. Again, no clear definition in literature. Uh, there's lots of different ones. I'll go with uh, um, uh, the Jesse Shell one I found. And dark patterns just means that the game developer de decides uh, or decides to design a game in a way that's not uh, that's not fun for different reasons, mostly for the reason of uh, making uh, getting players to pay some money. The most prominent, and I only show you a few of those dark patterns, are playing by appointment, meaning there's uh, on the on, on the one hand there's a time limited offer. Here you see that uh, this offer ends in three hours. And of course, this is a very good offer because if you buy these eight legendary king chests right now, um, you have a much better price than if you do it later. Uh, that's creating pressure to buy now or never. Uh, on the other hand, it means also that there are time limited events inside the game. Meaning uh, a game developer, for example, sees on Friday evening, people do not play because they have other things to do. And so they decide to um, double the experience points that are possible to be gained during Friday evenings in order to keep people playing. Then there's the daily rewards, very well known. Um, if you log into a game like Brawl Stars here uh, for eight days subsequently, you get um, subsequently better rewards for doing so. Thus creating a habit of looking into the game at least once a day, even without playing. And that's the aim of the whole mechanic. Uh, it's, it's, its aim is to create the habit of looking into the game without even thinking about it. If you want to play it or not, it doesn't matter. You have to look at it. You have to open it. Muscle memory is a thing here. I don't know any of you if any of you experienced this, but I did uh, on my smartphone when I uh, I've read it on my smartphone, and sometimes I close it, and then my my fingers open it again without me wanting to do it. And it's really startling. It's really strange. I know a lot of people who experienced this. Uh, I think that works. There's the infinite treadmill. Of course, uh, there's games like Candy Crush here on the left-hand side, or uh, the set Coin Master on the right side, that cannot really be finished, because as soon as a significant number of people reach a level of 3,000 here, um, the game just updates, brings new levels, brings new content, um, leads players to, uh, to invest more time, invest more money, hopefully, for them. Designers and this power creep very uh, similar to the aforementioned updates, um, meaning that you pay money in order to get a good item, to get a good card, to be competitive. In this case, this uh, this is Hearthstone, um, and a good card in this case is. And with the next updates, there comes a better card, rendering the money you spent useless. So you have either the the possibility to spend more money, or to say no. It's enough, I don't want to spend any more money rendering all the money you spent to this time uh, more useless. 
it's akin to to some psychology behavior uh, that's uh, called tracing in gambling. We we'll come to that. And of course, there's artificial scarcity, meaning um, sometimes the game uh, says that that there's uh, that some skins are very rare. Um, in this case, this is a pink Mercy skin in Overwatch that was available only for three weeks and um, uh, was a marketing stunt for for Overwatch. They they spent the revenue, uh, they gave the revenue to the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. And the revenue this uh, created in this three weeks was about $12 million. So um, and many people decided to buy this pink Mercy because uh, they knew that it would only be available for this short time. It was a ultra rare skin in Overwatch. And this is the last one. Uh, the endowment effect, meaning that if you own something, you deem it more valuable than it actually is. Meaning that uh, if some, something is yours, if you uh, if you have something, uh, then you think it might be uh, worth more than it actually is. In this case, this is a clash of clan base. You see that the investments uh, that, that people think that it's really some worth something that they have because when they stop playing, they don't just stop and close the app and uh, and deinstall it, but they have a ritual. This is a quit base. Quit base is a uh, commonly found, or frequently found in games like Clash of Clans where people uh, here with walls write something, write a message for the other players in order to ritualize their quitting of the game. Okay, we could go on uh, very long with these kinds of things, but I think this is a small overview and I want to get into the empirical part uh, as well. From a PhD thesis, um, I conducted interviews as well, um, qualitative interviews with about 30 adolescents, in families and traditional family systems on the one hand, and in um, institutions of, of child welfare on the other hand, meaning these are young people who have been taken out of their family um, for their own good, hopefully, or for their own better. And very, a few of those findings I will discuss with you now. Firstly, spending money is a totally common practice among young people. Uh, meaning that for me as a more mature player, or maybe for also for some of you, spending money in the in-game, uh, spending money in-game is kind of, uh, it's, it doesn't feel natural, it doesn't feel familiar, yes? it's, 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 it's something new. For the people here, not. Um, there are people there that, in, that invested more than 1,000 euro that said that they invested more than 1,000 euro. This is a small statement from Beranek, a young boy, 11 years old admitted to have paid four or five hundred euros and uh, it's, it's very interesting because the the behavior is almost let always almost always legitimized over uh, other players over the behavior of other players meaning i do spend this much money but all the others spend it as well so it's okay uh very often also found also found in the in the question how long do you play video games um it's always the others who play more um, it's always, yeah, I paid uh, 500 euros, 400 euros, but I know some people who paid 1,000 euros. And these are the problematic people. Me, I'm fine. Yeah. It's always uh, it's always a legitimization because you see something, uh, someone else um, apparently doing it differently. Uh, from the 30 participants of the study, 27 uh, said that they paid in uh, money in in-game transactions. So this is a very common practice. Um, of course, this is not a uh, quantitative, quantitative study, but there's tendencies. Okay, let's take a short look on which dark patterns uh, occurred. Artificial scarcity, as I said, uh, did build pressure on some young people in order to buy. This is a 14-year-old Anton who said that he spent uh, 400 euros but who was of the opinion that this uh, this 400 euros are well spent because now he has skins that are super rare and they are never in the store again and he's very happy about this uh, about this come out for him there's the infinite treadmill um, meaning that the game has no end and there's always updates uh, that tends to build pressure on some young people there's Ludwig a 15 year old boy who plays Clash of, Clash of Clans and um, who tells about his experiences playing Clash of Clans, having to donate 
into his clan having to spend time because there's the idea of reciprocity. There's the idea that he has to give something back to the clan if he gets something. And uh, who also described it as quite pressuring. Uh, now he has to continue to build up. He has to continue to do all kinds of things in this game because the, the update can, came and uh, always coming. And this builds pressure on him. There's playing by appointment, which was very interesting because there was not many, but there were a few uh, of the participants who stated that they structured their daily, everyday life around gaming events. There was a, a young boy who said if he doesn't have his smartphone at uh, eight o'clock in the evening, he gets really angry because, um, because there's, he's playing a, a free-to-play game, wrestling game, I never heard of it. And, uh, and there's, there's um, an event at eight o'clock every day where you have better conditions or better, better drop rates, whatever, and he has to, um, has to be there. Otherwise, it really creates stress on him. So uh, this, he's not the only one. There were a few people who, who really said that they structured their everyday life around these um, gaming events, meaning that gaming developers have the power to say where uh, when people have to be somewhere. Or have to or have to open the game at least. I mean, in cases like Pokemon Go, it is also where have where people have to be. Yeah? Because if you remember the Pokemon Go hype, the first one, uh, I remember that I was at home uh, from rural Austria in a very small village, and I came home, and on the main square there were young people. I mean, a bunch of young people, 10, 15, and there were no young people in this village anymore. Not that I knew of, at least. And uh, and this was because there was a Pokemon center on the, on the main square. So the Pokemon, uh, so Niantic in this case, had the power to say when people have to be where by uh, making them play the games. I'm over-exaggerating, of course, but, uh, but there is our tendencies that are visible. And there's endowment. In this case, uh, Felix has the idea that, um, that he spent a lot of money in his Fortnite account, but he can always sell and recover the money maybe even gaining money uh, by doing so because it's actually worth twice that what he spent. Here, magical thinking, of course, uh, plays a big role. And it also, uh, it also has resemblances to chasing behavior that you might know from gambling. Chasing uh, meaning that uh, you spend money, maybe you lose 200 euro today in the casino, then you next day you have to go there because you have to get this 200 euro back. Yeah. Um, in this case, uh, there are similarities. I don't, I'm not saying that it's the same thing. One thing that's really, uh, what was really startling for me was a discrepancy in the perception and the practice of in-game transactions by the, by the um, adolescents. I believe. These are some of the statements they, uh, they made. Um, these young people were not only victims of this, of this mechanics. Many of them knew that they were questionable, to say the least, or many of them are questionable. Uh, here's Joseph saying that it's a ripoff and their miners are allowed to gamble. I guess he watched some YouTube videos about it because uh, this, that's actually how most of the uh, young people here um, are getting um, sensitive, sensitized to this topic. And here's Stefan saying that uh, he's angry with FIFA. Uh, unfortunately, he's not here, so he would be a very good companion against the discussion with Alex later on, but uh, Stefan, he says he's very angry with FIFA because um, in the middle of the season, he always gets strong opponents that paid a lot of money and then he, he has no chance anymore. So there's this term called the coiner, meaning it's a derogative term, meaning that uh, people spend money and, it's, and that's why they're better. Yeah? Subsequently, uh, startlingly, uh, everyone, in the, uh, everyone who said that they despise income transactions um, does do them. Everyone does them. Yes. Uh, meaning that, that they, on the one hand, it's, they say these, these, these actions are despicable. On the other hand, they proceed in the practice of uh, buying things in, in free to play games. But um, it's the same thing like earlier. But the problem are the, the people that pay, that pay more than them. The problem is not them because they only paid 50 euros. The other people paid, uh, paid 100 euros. So they are coiners. Okay, so this leads, of course, to the question, if, this is the last question, uh, if, um, if they are despicable, these in-game transactions, 
uh, then why would you do them in the first place? So a quick look at the motives for purchase. Uh, there's of course this running gag in free to play games. Me, <laughs> that's going that uh, you pay in order to not play the game, which is of course a very, very smart game design decision to make a game as good, but not too good so that uh, you're still uh, interested to pay instead of play it permanently. Uh, he email uh, said that he uh, bought an auto mode uh, for his game so he doesn't have to play it anymore. Of course, very relieving. Uh, but there are three main motives that I could make out in, um, in the study. There's firstly, competitiveness. Players want to stay competitive, um, meaning that uh, they have, want to stay able to beat their opponents, to beat their peers in the first place in the game. Secondly, that's a big status gain connected to certain rare skins, to certain uh, wins in video games, to, to, to a victorious behavior. And thirdly, uh, and this is a uh, part that comes from outside, the other, you could argue, are uh, intrinsic motives. The third is, um, is uh, our feelings of pressure that these people um, experience due to the game design and due to the dark patterns that take place in the game. So these dark patterns do play a role. The question is, uh, do they play a role for everyone? And uh, this is, a, in, my, in my opinion, the most important question, because uh, as in gambling as well, in mobile games, there tend to be a concentration of spending, meaning that a very small proportion of the players account for a big amount of the revenues. Here it is with mobile games about 5.5% that account for 67% of the revenues. So uh, the question that I'll be working on right now, to uh, hopefully get a permit to, uh, to, to do this research, is uh, who are those 5.5%? 5, 5 are these players who um, have lots of money and lots of um, fundings and just, uh, just decide to spend it in video games? Or are these especially vulnerable population groups that are preyed upon by uh, some game developers and some publishers with these uh, game mechanics that I just explained. Okay, that was very fast. Thank you very much for your uh, for listening. I'm very happy to answer questions and I'm for looking forward to a short discussion right now. Thank you very much, Markus. I will start a little bit with questions and 